very famous horse jockey. He's, he's passed away since uh, for a while, as, as well as Wilt Chamberlain. Um, what do we know about horse jockeys in general? They're short. So this gentleman, uh, he was only 4 feet 11, and he weighed 98 pounds. But, but as a horse jockey, that's a good thing, because he, in his career, which he, he, he jockeyed horses from 1949 to 1990, 41 years, he won 8,833 races. Wow. Yeah. Um, Willie Shoemaker. Now, what if I told you that Wilt Chamberlain and Willie Shoemaker once did a photo shoot together? It's true. And this is what it looked like. In 1987, they got together. They did a photo shoot. Will Chamberlain, 7 feet 1. Willie Shoemaker, 4 feet 11. Okay. Now, if I were to say to you that Will Chamberlain is taller than Willie Shoemaker, would that statement be true or false? True. It would be true, right? Why? You can obviously see he's taller. Okay. You can see it. That's true. That helps you know that it's true, but what, what makes it true, though? What makes it true? Seeing it helps, but if you didn't see it, would it still be true? The people who kind of measure and do those statistics, if you saw the statistics. Okay. So I saw some other hands. Yeah, uh, uh, Frank. The fact that he has greater height than him makes him taller. That is the reality, and that makes it true, whether or not you want to believe it, whether or not you see it. Okay, I heard a, I heard a key word some, you said about reality. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. So that's a good definition. It's taller than him. Whether or not you want to believe it, whether or not you think truth is relative or objective or whatever, the fact of the matter is his height is greater than his height, so he's taller. Right, and that I, I liked what you said. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Yes. If you also wanted to test that, if you knew he's their height, you could do the math and you're like, okay. If seven feet is higher than four feet, you could easily do the math and figure out, okay, he's obviously over two feet taller than that. Exactly. So, again, th this is just a this is a fine working definition of truth. It's that which corresponds to reality. Now, I know this seems kind of basic, but we're going to we're we're going to build on this, okay? Um, but again, in, in our culture now, sometimes this kind of thing, like people need to hear this because um, I think there's a problem with sometimes about things corresponding to reality. Um, so, with truth, there are there's objective truth and there is subjective truth. Okay, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about them both. We're going to spend a lot of time on the objective truth aspect. So, what is objective truth? Um, as it says, the condition that makes something true is rooted in the object itself. It's independent of someone's feelings, opinions, preferences, or emotions. Okay, the object themselves. These are the objects. The reality is rooted in that. Okay, it's objective. You don't have to know about it necessarily, but it can still be true. Even if you didn't see it, it would still be true. Um, so that's objective truth. There's also something called subjective truth. The condition that makes something true with subjective truth, subjective truth is rooted in the subject itself. Okay? And it actually is dependent on the subject's feelings, opinions, preferences, or emotions. It is dependent. Another way to think of it Subjective truth claims are made by people about their first-person, private, internal states, okay? Because the subject is making, is the condition for the truth-making, okay? That's inside, it's a, it's a private, internal state. Subjective truths imply things like, I prefer, I like, I feel, I enjoy, those types. You're talking about yourself, an internal state, okay? And I think Frank said, you know, if Willie Shoemaker felt like he was seven feet tall, well, that, that's irrelevant because he's not seven feet tall. It doesn't correspond to reality, regardless of his opinions or feelings. Um, and because they're based on um, your internal state, they can change. Your emotions can change. Your preferences can change. Um, so that's kind of the difference between objective and subjective truth. We're going to come back to that in a little bit as well. Um, I just like that picture. That's really cool. So, um, All right. So if I were to uh, say that George Washington was the first president of the United States, is that an objective or a subjective truth? Objective. Objective, right? Okay. You may not like it. You may not even know about it. You could be living on an island somewhere in the South Pacific, never even heard of George Washington. That doesn't make it not true. He was still the first president of the United States. 
Okay, it's objectively true. Columbia State Capitol, again, an objective truth. Okay, and forgive me for being so um, obvious with these things, but as George Orwell once said, we've now sunk to a depth at which the restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. Okay, so again, we're going to build on this. I'm just laying the foundation of truth here. All right. Now, if I were to say to you that the Pittsburgh Steelers are my favorite team, they're not. But if I were to say that, <laughs> and you say that the New England Patriots are your favorite team, are we saying anything actually about the teams themselves? Or are we saying something about our own selves? Right. So is that a subjective or an objective truth? Right, it's subjective, right. Okay, these aren't hard questions. Um, because the condition of that truth statement is rooted in the, the subject, me or you. Now, if I were to say that the Pittsburgh Steelers have won more Super Bowls than the New England Patriots, that actually is an objective truth. The Steelers have won six Super Bowls over the course of their time together. The Patriots have only won five. Now, the Patriots have been in more Super Bowls, but they've only won five. And the uh, Steelers have won six. That's an objective fact. I may not like it, um, or I may think it's great. It doesn't matter. But the truth is, the Steelers have won. The objective truth is they've won more Super Bowls. Uh, what about this? <laughs> now, Devin might find this cat just adorable. And, <laughs> and, and, Jay, and Jay may find this cat just hideous. Okay? <laughs> Some may say it's objective, but it actually is a subjective truth because aesthetic, uh, aesthetic taste is an, is an opinion. It's based on your opinion, okay? I'm kind of undecided myself, but um, does anyone have any cats like this? Everyone had a cat? No, okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Now, but if I were to say this cat has two ears, two eyes, and a tail, that's an objective truth, right? It's objectively true regardless of my opinions about how it looks. <sighs> okay, everyone get the difference. This is, I'm sure, review, but it's just, again, we, we have to lay the foundation here on something, and, and we're going to start here. Um, all right, so for the rest of the talk, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the nature of truth um, and kind of the realm of objective truth. Pardon me for just for a second. Any questions, by the way? All right. Okay, so the, the nature of truth, okay, um, kind of five characteristics, and this would be objective truth that we're talking about, but, it, you know, truth in general. Um, the, truth about, and the truth about reality, okay, it's knowable. Truth about reality is discovered. It's not invented. Truth about reality is universal. It's exclusive, and to deny the reality of truth, period, is self-defeating. And we're going to talk about each one of these a little more in depth, okay? We're going to start with the truth about reality is knowable, okay? Um, you know, if we couldn't learn truths, or if we didn't even think it was possible to learn any truth, we wouldn't try to learn anything at all, right? Like, why would we even try to learn anything if we didn't think there was some truth that, that's the final end goal of what we're trying to learn, okay? We wouldn't investigate chemistry or biology or physics. We wouldn't explore outer space. Um, you know, we wouldn't listen to witnesses in courts, in courtrooms, right? If we didn't think there was, the truth was actually knowable, okay? We, we take this for granted, I think, but again, it's something that needs to be said um, because there are some that would deny that we can know truth, okay? But uh, just a common sense approach to this, we all, I mean, why are you here in college? Presumably to learn <laughs> something in a field of study that I hope you think that you're being taught the truth, right? You don't want to go finish your college degree and think, I was taught falsehood my whole four years in college, right? Right, I'm just saying, but like, yes, we, we assume that truth is knowable, but yet you may hear, oh, truth is not knowable. We're going to talk about that a little more later. Next aspect. Truth about reality is discovered. It's not invented. What does that mean? Let's talk a little more about that. So truth exists independent of anyone's knowledge of it. So kind of going back to the Wilt Chamberlain we were, and Willie Shoemaker example, we were talking about 
you know, even if no one knew who, even who those two people were, it doesn't make the f that uh, fact that Wilt is taller than Willie not true. Okay, it's still true, independent of anyone's knowledge. Something can be true even if no one believes it, and something can be true even if, or something can be false even if everyone believes it. Now we're gonna we're gonna do some examples here. I just want to get through these. We can believe something is true. Okay, why do we believe anything at all in general? Usually because we think it's true, right? We can have false beliefs, but we any beliefs that you hold, if you if you didn't think they were true, you wouldn't have that belief in general. But you can believe something is true, but we can't make it true. Okay, ideally we want our beliefs to marry up to truth. But you can have false beliefs. And truth is not dependent on our our sincerity. You can really 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 believe something sincerely, but it may not be true. It doesn't make it true. So let's look at some examples. Okay, truth about reality is discovered, not invented. The planet Neptune was discovered September 23rd, 1846. Now, on September 22nd, 1846, was there a planet out there circling the sun? Yes, we just hadn't discovered it yet. We hadn't named it Neptune because we didn't know about it, but it was still there. We discovered that, okay? Truth about reality exists independent of anyone's knowledge. So did you know there's actually a true answer to the number how many ants are there on the earth? There's got to be, right? <laughs> there's only so many ants on the earth. I'm not sure if anyone would even know the answer. And not, not an estimate either, like an exact number. Right. Numbers. At a certain time, I mean, ants live and die and all that, but at a certain time, there has to be an exact true number of ants on the planet. And that exists whether or not we have any knowledge of it. I'm just making the point. We don't have to know about something for it to be true. Okay? That would be an interesting, uh, I don't know if you could ever be done <laughs> to know how many hands are on the earth. And again, another example, truth about reality exists independent of anyone's knowledge. Well, a murderer is still guilty of murder even if no one knows it, even if he's never caught. If he killed someone and is never caught, prosecuted, it doesn't change the fact, it doesn't change the truth that someone was murdered, even though we don't know about it. How about this one? Something can be true even if no one believes it, and something could be false even if everyone believes it. Okay, we all know that there was a time under the uh, Ptolemaic system where the Earth was thought to be the center of the solar system. That was not true, even though everyone believed it. Okay, later, uh, under the Coper uh, Copernican model, uh, we put the sun where it should be, in the center of the solar system. Okay, again, the point is you can believe something and it's false, and everyone could believe it, or no one could believe it and it could still be true. Everyone follow me? Okay. How about this one? We can believe that something is true, but we cannot make it true, no matter how sincerely we hold that belief. Okay, you can believe the moon is made of cheese, you can believe that Mary Todd Lincoln killed her husband, and you can believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, you can believe, you know, as sincerely as you want, it doesn't correspond to reality. It's not true. It's not objectively true. Which dream did I crush? Which dream? Oh. You know, I saw a study, actually, and it's been contested because it was some article that came out in an Indian website, I mean India, like on the other side of the world, that said that 7% of Americans believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. No. Has anyone ever seen that study? Church believers. There are articles that said it was ridiculous, it wasn't true, and that they did the numbers weird and all that, but um, anyway, moving along. <laughs> All right, we can believe something is true, oh, again, but we can't make something true no matter how sincerely we hold that belief. We've all heard of flat Earth people, right? Yeah. All the other planets in the solar system are round, but somehow the Earth is flat, right? Does not correspond to reality. <laughs> now, now, sadly, this, this belief has overflowed into other areas, too. Um, there's actually a, there's, there's a flat Death Star. 
um, society, from what I understand as well. So. <laughs> Okay, point number three, a third characteristic of truth. Truth about reality is universal. It's equally true for all people. We're talking about objective truth about reality. Okay, two for two, two plus two equals four for all people at all times, in all places. Um, you know, two plus two does not equal five. If you were tortured and, you know, like in 1984, the novel, and, and told that two plus two equals five, even if you conceded that fact because you didn't want to be tortured anymore, it doesn't make that true. It's not objectively true. Um, gravity is the same for everyone on the planet. Okay, some experience maybe a little more than others, but um, based on our weight, but gravity is the same. If you stopped believing in gravity, you don't float away. You stay on the earth, right? It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's objectively true. It's universal. And again, George Washington was our first president. You can be in North Korea, China, some South Pacific Island, it doesn't matter if you've never heard of George Washington, it's true um, for all people, it's equally true. And last of all, Winthrop football is still undefeated. Yeah. That is universal, that's true for all people, right? <laughs> uh, do, do you guys want it to stay that way or do you want? Yeah. Yeah, you wanna stay undefeated? Okay. Now this next slide, I'm not here to get political, but I'm gonna make a point, okay? So don't throw any rotten tomatoes at me, all right? You probably already know what's coming. Okay, truth about reality is equally true for all people. It's universal. You can say Trump is not your president, okay? But the objective fact is Trump is the current president of the United States, regardless of your opinions, your feelings, your preferences, or your emotions, okay? And he will be until he either resigns is voted out of office, dies in office, is impeached. What's the other option? Or well, I said die in office, but <laughs> yeah, or his time runs out, or, or he completes his term. I mean, right, or he completes his term, okay? Those are the only reasons why Trump would not be president anymore, okay? But as, a, as it stands, this is not objectively true. Someone, <laughs> Someone can believe this, but that doesn't make it true, okay? Fourth point, truth about reality is exclusive. All right. Again, this is like first grade. The opposite of true is false. We all get that, okay? Now, truth, by its very nature, excludes what is false. That's just how truth works, okay? Based on the law of non-contradiction that, contradiction that says opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same way. So let's look at a few examples here. Okay, these are examples of, of contradictions that both statements cannot be true at the same time in the same way. Okay, Earth is the third planet from the sun or Earth is not the third planet from the sun. Okay, one is true and one is false, but they can't both be true. God exists, God does not exist. Today is Tuesday, today is not Tuesday. These are contradictory statements. The law of non-contradiction says they cannot both be true at the same time in the same way. Um, now there, be, there may be certain people in certain parts of the world that have this, I don't know what you call it, it's more like an Eastern mindset that says the law of non-contradiction doesn't exist, but to deny it, you're actually using the law of non-contradiction. To deny something, you're affirming, uh, affirming it. Um, there's a quote that probably some of you have seen before. Excuse me, if you've been around in our class, this was a uh, medieval f philosopher, Avicenna. He said, anyone who denies the law of non-contradiction should be beaten and burned until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as not to be beaten, and to be burned is not the same as not to be burned. Okay. Now, we would want to be a little more graceful in our um, engagements with folks, <laughs> but uh, this... This makes the point, okay? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite the quote. Um, it, it makes sense, right. It, it brings the point home with, uh, with clarity, exactly. Um, okay, here we go. 
I think we, we mentioned this earlier, you can have contrary beliefs, okay? Two people can believe different things about what may be true or not, but you cannot have, con you can't, but contrary truths are not possible. Something cannot be true and not true in the same way, in the same time, same sense, okay? We can have different beliefs, but not different truths. And this point is, is kind of important in our society too. Okay, someone who actually holds a genuinely true belief cannot be called arrogant or intolerant simply because the challenger doesn't like the fact that that belief is true. Okay, truth by its very nature, again, is exclusive. It excludes things that are not true. And if someone has a genuinely true belief, you can call that person arrogant, but they're just holding a true belief. You may not like that belief, but your belief, your preference, your, your opinion is not gonna change the fact that that may be an actual true belief. And then this last one, okay, to deny the reality of truth is self-defeating. This is almost like the law of non-contradiction. To deny truth is actually to affirm it. Um, and I know we've gone over some of these in our, in our classes before. Um, also known, self-defeating, you can say self-refuting. The, the fancy name is self-referentially incoherent. That's a big, long phrase. I prefer either just self-refuting or self-defeating. These are statements that both affirm and deny the same basic meaning. We're going to look at some examples. The important thing is all self-refuting statements are false. Um, these statements self-destruct when the claim is actually applied to itself and it, when it, and it fails to meet its own standard. Okay, here's a classic example. Nothing is written in stone, and yet it's written in stone, right? So that... <laughs> yeah. That yes. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. <laughs> That's good, Taylor. Hadn't thought of that. Or another one is yeah. I'm not speaking English right now. Right. I can't speak a word of English. That's self-refuting. It's often funny. I mean, we get kind of a chuckle out of it because it is hilarious sometimes um, because it, it's so absurd. Um, now, so let's look at this statement. There is no truth. We may have heard this before, read it. Just, I mean, it's, it's kind of out there in the, the cultural milieu, okay? But let's look at this. So if we see a claim like this, we can, we can put it to the test. We can say, well, is this true? Yes or no? Well, let's look. If there is no truth is true, then the conclusion is there's truth. You get it? This statement is false, but that means that there actually is truth. Let's go to the other side. There is no truth is not true. Well, the conclusion is there's truth. What's the point? Truth is undeniable, okay? Our reality is structured on the idea. Truth is almost like a... I don't know how you describe it, like a jujitsu kind of <laughs> opponent. You know, you can't take it down. It's, it's undeniable. If you deny it, you're affirming it. And if you affirm it, obviously, it, you're affirming it. It's true. Um, so how do, we engage, how do we engage statements like this? You know, if you're in a conversation talking about your faith, someone throws out there, there is no truth. Um, you know, how can we respond? How, how can we engage with this? Um, some of the veterans here in Rasha Christi, we, we know the answer to this, but it's good for the, for the new folks, okay? We want to apply the claim to itself. And then we want to ask a question to show that the uh, claim is actually self-defeating, okay? Apply the claim to itself and then ask a question. So let's look at this. There is no truth, <sighs> okay? Well, if we apply the claim to itself, it means if there's no truth, then that statement is false because there would be at least one truth, namely, that there's no truth. There'd be at least one truth. I mean, the statement is false, but that's why it's false, because there would be at least one truth, that that would be true, but it's false. So how might we, what's a good response that we could, if we hear this, we're talking to someone, what's a question we might ask? Cody? Is that true? Okay, we're gonna go through a few more examples of this. Now, I mean, you're not doing it to be like um, snarky or anything. I'm just, I'm just, for brevity, I'm keeping it short here. 
but you want to ask it so that someone, hopefully, they surface the truth for themselves. Okay, if they really believe, if they're walking around with this belief and you ask that, instead of just outright pointing it out to them, you know, if you ask, by asking a question, it might put some gears in place and they might actually surface the, the truth of why that's false themselves. Think about this though, if there's no truth, any book written by an atheist can't be true either. Okay, so just saying. All right, so let's do uh, some more examples of these. Apply the claim to itself, then ask a question to show that the claim is self-defeating. This one's very similar to what we just looked at. There's no objective truth. Okay, again, apply the claim to itself. The claim of no objective truth is expressed uh, as an objective truth that is true for everyone. Uh, the person making the claim believes in at least one objective truth that there is no objective truth. So the statement would be false because it refutes itself. What's a question we might ask to point this out? Yes. Very good. We're going to do some more of these, so I need some participation. <laughs> All right, truth cannot be known. Apply the claim to itself. Well, if that's so, how is it possible to know that truth? What's a question we could ask? How do we know the truth cannot be known? How do you know truth can't be, can, can be known? Anyone else? How do you know yeah, the basic idea is like, well, how did you come to know this truth? How did you come to know this truth if truth can't be known? Again, you're pointing out the self-contradiction and the self-refuting uh, nature of the, of the statement itself. Here's one. All truth is relative. So the statement, the person uttering this, they presume, uh, the statement presumes itself to be true for all people in all places and all circumstances. But if truth is relative, then this statement is also relative and it can't apply to anything other than itself. So therefore it's false. Um, what's a question we might ask? Is that objectively true? Okay. Anyone else? Is that a relative truth? Is that a relative truth? That's good. That's not what I put, but that's good. What I put was, are you trying to convey to me an absolute truth with this statement? You know, something like that. Because with all these claims, too, they're, they're basically exempting their own claim from the claim itself, which is why it's self-refuting. Um, it's the self-exempting fallacy, I think it's called. You apply it to everything else except your own claim. All right? You can never know anything for certain. Well, people who say this are often quite certain that they know what they're talking about. What's the question? Are you completely certain about that? Okay. <laughs> So like the more you do of these, you'll, you'll start to like, you'll, you'll develop an ear and an eye for it. Okay. Cause you, you may, I'm sure you probably heard some of these and if not, you're going to, here we go. Talking about arrogance again, it's arrogant to assume that you know the truth with certainty. Well, the person who makes such a claim, they appear to be arrogantly certain of one truth that no one can be certain of the truth. So what's something we might ask for that of that? <laughs> Honesty. Anyone else? Do you know that truth is certain? Yeah, that's kind of what I came up with. Um, Taylor's a little more blunt, but uh, <laughs> but I put um, and some of these like you you can recycle the same questions because they apply to a lot of the different statements. Okay, are you completely certain about that? And again, hopefully, if you ask someone that that may make that claim, you're trying to make them surface like other than flat out saying to their face, you're being arrogant, you know, make them surface the truth for themselves. Um, here's a good one. The law of non-contradiction does not exist. Again, people who say this, they're using it to deny it. Any takers on this one? What might you say? It could also be true that it does exist. <laughs> That's kind of what, what I put. So you agree with me that it does exist. <laughs> No, I disagree with you be, that it doesn't exist. So you do agree with me that it does exist. Just keep saying that back and forth for as long as it takes until they finally get that you're saying yes and they're saying no. Okay, again, to deny it is to affirm it. That's true for you, but not for me. This one's very common. Okay. That's true for everyone. People who say this presume their view is true for all people in all places at all times. They're exempting their own view. They're saying this for everyone else, but not their own view. And what did I hear? Who said that? 
Is that true for everyone? Michaela? No, I just have a question. Yeah, yes. Couldn't you also um, question, like point out that this reason is subjective rather than relative and like start a completely different conversation? You could, yeah. I just, anything you can take away from tonight to as a put in your toolbox, for sure, <laughs> yeah. Yes? Respond to that, that's your opinion. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I guess it was Ryan that said it. Is that statement true for everyone? Is that what you said? Okay, yeah, that's the basic gist. And you could also say this, is that statement true only for you and not for me? Again, you're throwing it back on. They exempted themselves the first time, but now you're going to throw it back. Is that statement only true uh, for you, but not for me? Okay. Um, all truth claims are just attempts for power and control. This is kind of a postmodern way of looking at truth. So again, they seem to be exempting themselves from their own claim. Response is that statement an attempt at power and control. Okay. You should be skeptical of everything. People who say this don't seem to be skeptical of skepticism. What might you say? Should I be skeptical of that? <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I put, is there a reason why I shouldn't be skeptical of that statement? Throw it back on them. It, and again, you're not being like snarky. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting things in brevity, but you know, you can say, you know, I'm really curious. Is there a reason? And try not to be sarcastic either. It's hard not to be. <laughs> but, but again, we're, try, we're trying to advance conversations. You know, we're going to have topics later in the uh, semester on tactical um, evangelism. This is, this is a part of it, okay, about how to, you know, in, in your conversations, engage folks. Um, we, we don't want the conversation to end. We want it to keep going. Yes, Pastor Bear. And I think when we're, when we're doing this kind of thing, this is good to ask pointed questions and get people to think, but I think we also have to recognize and, and affirm when we're talking to people that, um, that sometimes the, the truth is hard to discover. And that, and sometimes people resort to these kinds of ideas, denial of truth, because they've struggled to discover the truth. And so, to, 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 to talk them down from that ledge and to say, I know that the truth is sometimes hard to discover, uh, or even to agree on, right. uh, on certain things. Um, but, but, you know, don't get, don't be discouraged, <laughs> right. and don't resort to a self-defeating argument. But rather, let's explore these things together and not give up. Let's keep looking for it. Right. I, I would agree. And, and the other thing, too, a lot of these, I mean, they're just slogans. So a lot of folks have picked up slogans over the year that, over the years that sound clever. And, you know, I'm, I'm very intellectual because I can say this. But have they really ever stopped to, to think about the implications of the statements themselves? And that's what I'm trying to get us to, to just walk away with. Yes. I saw a hand up somewhere. Okay. Um, so what we've been doing, this is called the roadrunner tactic. Um, you may have heard that phrase before. I know those, a lot of us that have been here for a while. Um, what we've been doing, when you apply the claim to itself and then ask a question, they call that the roadrunner tactic. Frank Turek calls it that. Does anyone know who the roadrunner is? I know we're getting like further. In, okay. Because they don't show those on TV much anymore. They're too violent, I think. I know, they're too violent. But um, says, don't try this at home. Which is also sad. But, but where the name comes from, the, the idea is, if you remember, if you've ever seen any of the cartoons, you know, Wile E. Coyote, he was always falling off cliffs and, and things like that. But the, the funny thing was, he actually wouldn't fall until what? Really he looked down, right? And then he realized there was no foundation beneath him, and that's when he falls, okay? So that's the idea of this Roadrunner tactic, is we're basically nudging people to look down for some of these statements, okay, and realize... There's no foundation underneath these claims. There is no truth. You know, you, sh you can't be certain of anything like that. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where the idea of the roadrunner tactic comes from. It's, it's just a, it's a nice um, memory aid to, to remember. So again, apply the claim to it itself. Ask a question. Um, I just want to do a few more of these because these are getting into a little more of religion. The others were dealing more like with truth. Um, but now we're getting into things about God. Okay. So no one can know the truth about God. Well, this person seems to know at least one truth about God, that you can't know anything about it, right? So what might you ask? How did you come to know that truth about God? Okay. Just apply the claim and then ask a question that points out the self-refuting nature. 
talking about God is meaningless. Okay, this person has made a statement about God and presumes actually that it has meaning. What might you ask? <laughs> Possibly, yeah. I put, what does that statement about God mean? Okay, if I'll talk about God is meaningless, well, what does that statement even mean? Um, people should be left alone, alone to believe what they want to believe. Then oh. why are you talking to me? Yeah, so see, they've engaged you, and they're telling you what to believe. And then you might say, are you claiming that I should believe what you just said? Because you're, you're engaging me. You want me to believe that. You can't talk about religion. Well, they're talking about religion, but they're denying your right to do so. You might say something like, I'm curious, what, why are you allowed to talk about religion, but I'm not? And then they might say what? I'm not talking about religion, but that's self-refuting. It's like, I can't speak a word of English, right? Okay, you get the idea. We're going to talk more about this when we, do, we talk about pluralism later in the uh, semester. But um, no single religious perspective should be affirmed over another. Well... Believe it or not, this person is actually re affirming a religious perspective over all the others, which is you can't affirm one over all the others. But that claim is itself exclusive. Okay? I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it's exclusive because they're making a truth claim. Yeah? Would that person be agnostic? Um, possibly, or they could be a pluralist, which basically means like all religions are true, which... Yeah, right. We've talked about this, and we'll talk about later in the semester, but all religions can't be true because they make contradictory truth claims, right? Um, just logically, they can't all be true. Um, oh, yeah. So can you tell me why I should believe that religious perspective? That could be a question you could ask. Um, you should stop trying to persuade others. Are you trying to persuade me with that statement? It's all a matter of opinion. So here's something. So maybe if you're in a, a conversation, you're sharing your faith, you're talking about some deep topics, someone dismisses your view as mere opinion. Well, they think that their opinion is true and your opinion is false. Um, so the statement, it's all a matter of opinion, they're actually making a truth claim. So you might ask, is that just your opinion? To kind of point it out, right? Um, everyone should keep their beliefs to themselves. Well, they are expressing a belief is there a reason why you're expressing that belief? Um, now this one, this is the last one. Now this was actually uttered. I was listening to a podcast recently and I actually heard this and then I looked it up on the internet and there's actually footage of this. <laughs> okay, we're gonna look at it. Does anyone know who Deepak Chopra is? Yes, a new age, a very prominent figure in the new age movement. Um, he actually said all belief is a cover up for insecurity. So, so the response, we're actually going to watch a little video here. It's only about a minute long. Yeah. Hopefully the volume. Oh, yeah. You just touch it. No. Oh, yeah. You got to punch it. Devin, you're the strong man here. Go for it. And throw one of your weights at it. <laughs> oh man, this worked earlier. Just uh, pull it up on YouTube. You to, can you? Can you? pull it up on YouTube. Oh. Go back. Can you move the mouse over to the right? <laughs> Go ahead. To get it onto the screen. Oh. Oh, thank you. I want to take another question. There's a gentleman in the red shirt back there. He's had his hand up for a while. Come up to the microphone. Uh, my my question's for, for Deepak and and uh, the bishop. Now, you stated before that all belief is a cover-up for insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. You believe that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was. That was actually uh, Leonard Malakas, the guy that co-authored uh, with Hawking a universe from nothing, I think, or 
That one they did. That last one, the Hawking did. That book. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Grand Design. Well, that, was, that was his co author. Okay, so, so you see how it actually kind of can work even in, in real life. It's not just the classroom exercise, okay? Now, that gentleman could have been maybe a little more um, charitable, perhaps, but he was making the point. Um, he was making the point that it was a self-refuting kind of, well, it's not even self-refuting. It was basically that Deepak was perhaps exempting himself from his belief or his truth claim for everyone else, okay? Um, it's interesting if... If you kind of looked at his face right at the moment, he, I think he, he got it. It's actually very similar to, <laughs> to the Wiley e. Coyote. It's a very similar expression. Um, now this one is not, this is just a self-refuting, uh, this next one. It's actually right there in front of you to see. Now this is the Mid-Ohio Atheists Twitter page. They actually spent money to make a billboard I, I didn't make this up. This is like, I checked their Twitter page just the other day. It's right there, okay? Mid-Ohio Atheist. It's self-refuting. I mean, they're... I mean, it seems simple, but it doesn't occur to some people, okay? Um, okay, so... Oh, I'm sorry. They try to say there's no God because that's what we're made of. And my question is, well, you're saying we're made of this, so we can't know what truth is. We can't know that we're alive. We can't know all this. Then how do you yourself know it and we don't? Right, they're exempting themselves from their own claims. Exactly. Okay, so the review about the five characteristics there of truth. Um, so here's what I wanted to get to as well. So the realm of objective truth, okay, people don't really doubt that we can know objective truths about science, medicine, math, chemistry, physics, biology, history, geography, law, things like that, right? We already kind of talked about that. Um, but when talking about religion or morality, now suddenly everything wants to be reverted to the subjective realm for folks that, that disagree with, with those views, okay? Um, so my question for you guys is, you know, why, why are religious truth claims often treated as subjective, as a matter of just our own preferences and opinions, instead of um, something that's objectively true? What, what are some reasons why you might think that's the case? Yes? Um, a lot of those other things, um, like medicine, math, science, they're based on empiricism, whereas religion can't be, for like the supernatural, you can't see it. Okay. Pastor Ware, I think it's on hand. I think a lot of times it's because Christians and the church and certainly many other religions present it that way. You know, they, they present, present their own beliefs as somehow outside of the realm of objective truth. Okay. Michaela? I think a lot of it has to do with, um, or at least the way I've seen like, different things in the world about the whole objective versus subjective truth with uh, religion is the idea that people don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to have to follow something or have something tell them what to do. And if somebody's going to tell them what to do, then that truth is just automatically subjective. The Bible's automatically <coughs> subjective because it tells me what to do with my life. Okay. Did I, did I see another hand? Taylor? No? Okay, same thing. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. So we just went through those five characteristics of the nature of truth. Well, look at this. We're, I'm not going to do the fifth one because it's mainly about the self-defeating stuff. But, okay, so the nature of truth, the perceived nature of religious truth. Well, if we say truth about reality is knowable, well, the perceived nature of religious truth is it's not knowable, okay? If truth about reality can be discovered, well, religious truth can't be discovered. I mean, that's, that's the perceived uh, nature of religious truth. Same thing here. Truth about reality is universal. Uh, well, it can't be universal. Um, and then it's exclusive. Truth about reality, the nature of truth itself, it is exclusive. But when you start applying that to religious claims, now you're arrogant. If you claim to know a certain religious truth, you're intolerant Okay, um, to, to claim a belief about God that's exclusively 
true. Um, so, you know, why do people think it's not knowable? Well, I mean, if God exists, and we would argue he does, but I'm just saying if God exists, you know, he seems to be hidden, right? He's, he might be obscure. Okay? He's not plainly obvious for folks that, that believe this, okay? So how can we know him if, if we can't measure him empirically, as you mentioned, okay? And they equate that inability to know the truth about it um, as, as simply not knowable. <sighs> Uh, The next one. So people don't think there's adequate ways or tools to actually discover religious truth. That would uh, handle number two there. Number three, because there's so many different beliefs, no one seems to agree on religious truth. Okay, so disagreement about religious truth is looked at as, well, it can't be universal because so many people disagree. So how can there just be, how can it be true for everyone if there's so many different opinions? Okay, That's, that's a fallacy, but that's the perception. That's my point. Uh, And then the last one, as we already mentioned, it's arrogant to say that you uh, claim the truth. You know, how dare you say that all paths to God are true? See what I did there? No, just kidding. (laughs) No, but it's it's just as arrogant to say that all paths to God are true. That's an exclusive claim, as as it is to say there's only one path to God, okay? But yet it's always the, the Christian, it seems, that take it on the chin when we make a truth claim. But to say that all paths lead to God, that's also a truth claim, and it's exclusive. Just saying. Um, Now, when we start talking about religious truth, this story always comes up, and probably most of you are familiar with this. It's about the six blind men and the elephant. Um, How many of you have heard this before? A few hands, no? Oh, good. Okay. Um, So... Well, I'll just quickly tell the story. So the, the, the fable of the six blind men and the elephant. Blind men, an elephant is brought in. They're asked to feel the elephant in different parts and to describe what they're feeling, okay? Um, so the first person grabs the, the trunk, feels like a snake, okay? Someone else grabs one of the tusks, feels like a spear. The ear feels like a fan. The legs feel like trees. Uh, the side feels like a wall, and then the person feeling the tail feels like a rope, okay? Now, this story is used in different ways for different purposes. It could be either to prove that all religions are false. That's one way to use the story. Uh, another is to show that no one religion has the truth. That's another way that the story is often used. Um, it can be shown that no one has a comprehensive understanding of the truth because disagreement, right? How can... You know, it's just an example. Um, Or to show that all truth is relative. All these guys are feeling different parts. They all come in up with different ideas. Uh, It can be used to prove that God is unknowable. And uh, last of all, it's often used to teach humility and tolerance for others. That's not a bad thing. We should be humble and tolerant of other views. I'm just saying that's the way the story is often presented. Now, does anyone see a problem does anyone see a flaw in the story? It's still an elephant. Yeah. It's still an elephant. Is that Jay? The person? Yes, who is the seventh person in the story? The person telling us. The narrator, the storyteller. Okay, so someone actually has an objective viewpoint on this. This seems to get forgotten about or just not brought up, okay? Um, So as someone said, I think, none of the blind men actually came to know any part of the truth, much less any part of the whole truth, okay? The elephant is not a snake. It's not a rope. It's not a tree. It's none of those things. So actually none of them had the truth at all. Only the storyteller has the objective viewpoint. Um, and it's because of this objective viewpoint that we know that the blind men are actually mistaken. Does everyone see that? So the fable is actually helpful, but not, not in the way that's originally, originally intended. Um, because what it actually proves is that objective truth exists. The objective truth is the elephant, right? And the reason why we know that is because of the seventh person in the story, as you mentioned, the narrator, the storyteller. 
Does everyone see that? Okay, so the, the story is often used in a way that we, um, for all those other reasons I mentioned, but if we stop to think about it, it actually proves objective truth. Okay, so why do I mention this? I'm, we're kind of wrapping up here, um, which it's after nine. Should we uh, keep going or maybe five minutes, I hope? Okay. Um, so again, we talked about religious claims being pushed to the side as subjective truth, but here's the thing, or subjective truth claims, but statements about God, they either correspond to reality or they do not. Because we're making a claim of reality, that makes it an objective truth claim, okay? It's not just based on my preference or your preference. They either do correspond to reality or they don't. All religious truth claims, not just Christianity, all religious truth claims, they make claims about universal reality, not just personal preferences. So again, that puts it in the objective realm. So if God exists, he exists for everyone. And if he doesn't exist, he doesn't exist for anyone. Again, that's an objective truth claim because it's talking about reality. So the truth about God, whether he exists or not, must be objective, not subjective. Now you can have subjective beliefs, but God, whether he exists or not, would be an objective truth claim, all right? So to wrap it up, conclusion. Christianity is not the kind of thing that can be true for you and not for me. It makes objective truth claims about reality. If it's true, it's true for everyone. And if it's false, it's false for everyone. But the point is, it is an objective, it makes objective truth claims, okay? Um, it makes truth claims about God, man, Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, origins, meaning, morality, destiny, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, all these things. Uh, it's not just, yes, I mean, Christianity is about what we normally think of Christianity, but it's more than that. It's, a, it's an actual objective truth claim about all of reality, okay? The way things actually are in the world. Um, and we don't have time. This would be beyond the scope of this topic tonight to talk about these things, but this is what we're going to spend the rest of the semester talking about. Philosophical arguments for God's existence, scientific arguments for God's existence, um, Worldviews, things like that. Okay, the, that's what we're going to spend the rest of probably the rest of the year talking about. My whole point is you need to think of Christianity and all religions as objective truth claims. They're making claims about reality. Um, so, one last question what, what would you say is the most important thing about Christianity? That is important. That is important, but there might be something that's still more important. I'm not trying to be uh, blasphemous here. Just making a point. From what standpoint? From a skeptical standpoint or a Christian standpoint? A Christian standpoint. Uh, that it's possible that you ain't going to hell and you live forever. That, that's important. That's I part mean, of I our... Mean, like, I don't know what... You, like, he kind of stated it. That's very important. I'm trying to make another point. Yes. Well, what I think from what is, oh. what we, is we have a choice. Is he saying, I'm here to redeem you because I love you, but because I love you, I'm offering you this choice. Do you want to love me back or not? And in the end, if you choose to love me, this is your reward. If you choose not to love me, here's how you get punished. Or here's your other reward or whatever. I don't deny that any of that is very, very, very important. I think some of the light bulbs are starting to come on now. Um, I'll go to uh, Shelby. Um, is it just that it's true for us and for everybody? Yes. Everybody That's kind of what I'm looking for, okay? Definitely. That the most important thing about Christianity is that it would be true. <laughs> because if it's not true, then what you said doesn't matter, okay? Now, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be heretical, blasphemous, anything like that. I'm not trying to put truth above uh, and relegate Jesus you know, under truth. The, the point is, truth is grounded in Jesus. 
He claimed to be the truth, right? In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, He is the foundation upon which all of Christianity is built. But if none of it is true, okay, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, said as much in 1 Corinthians 15. I just want to look at this, and then we will wrap up. Okay, This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 through 19. Paul, the Apostle, he says, And if Christ has not been raised which basically is saying, if it ain't true, if it never happened, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we above all people, we are of all people most to be pitied. Okay, so Paul the Apostle understood this as well. If it's not true, what are we doing? We're just wasting our time, right? So again, if you're a Christian and you're coming to our meetings, I hope you keep coming. If, if you've never heard like the reasons why Christianity is true, keep coming because that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester. If you're a skeptic, keep coming. If you're an agnostic or, or a Buddhist or whatever, okay, give us a fair shot. Listen to the arguments and the evidence, okay, why we believe. We're not just, these aren't just personal preferences is, is the point. We are making objective truth claims and we claim that this is objectively true for all people uh, at all times. So that is all I have to, to present.